Hello, John Ridley. How are you? Like that we are live. What are you doing here? What, <laughs> what's going on? I just happen to be sitting in front of my computer. What's going well, on? Here I am. Um, and it seems like we might be here with the entire world, uh, not to put too much pressure on you. Um, I could um, not be more excited. Hello, world. Uh, it's really an amazing thing. I just want to remind everyone, if you have never been to a Seed and Spark event before, and I'm Emily Best, I'm the founder and CEO of Seed and Spark. That is why I get the privilege of sitting on a chat for an hour with Mr. John Ridley. Um, uh, Seed and Spark has a code of conduct. And for the most part, I would summarize it uh, as like, be cool with each other. Um, but because we're out on the internet and this is a global audience and many of you may not have interacted with us before, um, just know that our um, our events are all governed by our code of conduct and we're here for creative energy. We're here for you know, spirited and interesting debate and disagreement that is also profoundly respectful um, because we are also here to tackle the real shit. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, so without further ado, Mr. John Ridley, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you brought this idea to us. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I, I'd love to hear sort of where it originated. Well, first of all, thank you. I mean, thank you for having me and thank you for what you guys do. This is our third event together and, yeah. you know, Seed and Spark is just an amazing organization in terms of how holistic you are and supporting artists and encouraging people. Um, hello to everybody around the world. I'm honestly, I'm blown away by how many people have chose to, you know, just take time out of your day, even when it seems like we have all the time in the world. Um, we still only have 24 hours so that many of you chose at odd hours to even be here. I, I cannot thank you enough. And um, I just want to say real quick, Emily, as we were talking before um, we sat down very sadly, um, I, I have to sort of acknowledge what's going on here in the United States. And it's very weird to be in a situation where for the last two months, the only thing that's been in the news is this horrible pandemic that we're all going through. And the only thing that has pushed it off the front page here in America is just three incidents in particular of just varying degrees of, of horrific um, racism, disregard, disrespect. And those are the ones that we know about. Um, so more than anything, I think those of you who know me at all through my art, a lot of it has been, you know, less about entertainment and more about, as you say, Emily, keeping the shit real with people in terms of how we interact. And to your question about how this originated for me originally was just, what's a way to encourage people? If you've got four more weeks of lockdown, how can you set goals for yourself? How can you try to, um, as an artist, as a creator, be as vibrant as possible. But as you and I spoke just before this, I think right now, more than anything with, and I don't know exactly how many people are, but maybe 1200 people from around the world, a diversity of voice and of thought is so necessary. So I would take today as an encouragement, you can take it just as an artist and say, hey, what kind of um, benchmarks and goals can I set for myself to get it done? But as people who I'm imagining are like-minded, you know, you're probably, you know, if you're showing up today, you know the kind of work that I do. So you're probably like-minded to encourage you to get your voices out there, whether it's um, history, whether it's a comedy, we, we need your voices because, and I don't want it to take up too much time and I don't want to turn into a polemic, but art has always outpaced society. And art has always been one step ahead in terms of representing people of color or people of traditionally marginalized backgrounds as being as vibrant and as vital a part of society as the prevailing culture. So uh, th there's no dispensable art. If it's comedy, if it's a romantic comedy, if it's a dumb comedy, it's as important as any serious um, or, or, or art that's presented as being serious and important. We need you, and I hope more than anything what you take away from today is is get your voice into the mix because we need you. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's uh, it's a strange time to be doing anything because we have these ginormous cultural forces to acknowledge and also the role of the artist is so vital here. And I think so many artists right now feel like a real desperation and scarcity, right? Yeah. Of like, 
Where do I put my energy and attention? How do I take time for my art when I feel like maybe I should be um, focusing entirely on activism or for, for those of you and bless you who are in the streets um, risking your lives on behalf of um, uh, the citizens who have been affected, uh, you know, <laughs> It's hard. To, it's hard to know how to focus right now, and it, so, yeah. No, I was going to say it's it's very hard to know how to focus. And the only thing I can say, look, I can't say you know if there was a piece of art that was going to change the world, somebody much more talented than I would have already done it. But what I can say is that when I came out to Hollywood around 1990, you know the numbers were even more bleak. They're not good now, no. but in terms of representation of people of color. You know, in front of the camera is one thing. We're so focused on that often, but it's behind the scenes, the producers, the people who are in critical decision-making positions. And if there's anything that I'm very proud of, it's that on my sets, um, the majority of people who have been in critical decision-making positions have been women, have been people of color, have been people of orientations different than my own. That's been on every single thing. 90% of our directors on American Crime were women. Um, and a lot of that has to do with Michael McDonald, the producer I worked with, who um, was very insistent on that. Certainly got no argument from me. But that begins with you as a creative starting your journey. Um, when I started, you know, I was lucky to be in the room. When I'm where I am now, I feel a responsibility to change things. So what we want to do today is really, you know, you may be in different spaces on your journey. I don't want to say to everybody, hey, you're starting your journey. But you, you've dialed in today for a reason. And what we want to do is encourage you to get your work done. Really focus on that. Understand, at least from my perspective, what these pillars of the process are. Use them as best you can in your process, because whatever works is all that really matters in the end. But more than anything, I think what Emily and I want to say to you is um, if you're feeling weird, if you're feeling ambivalent, if you're feeling depressed, not just about your situation, about the world, Take the thing that you can do as an artist and 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 activate it. It's no accident I'm wearing this T-shirt today. Um, we we all of us at the end of the day can only do what we can do with what God has given us. Um, but take it and use it. And 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 starting this conversation with just the fundamentals of writing, how can we help encourage you to do your best work? And by the way, sometimes your best work is just getting it done. Um, that was certainly my case. You know, well, my best work has taken years to get here, even if it's at its best. So let's start with that, Emily, and, and yeah. break down that process. And I just want to point out one thing, is that you are an artist who has focused on getting the work done. You don't even have a social media presence, which might be why people are so eager to get uh, some time with you. But we have folks watching right now. I've seen Nigeria, India, Spain, UK, all over Canada, all over the US, Mexico. Um, we, we are talking about your work, your ability to get shit done and tell the real story is literally uniting us globally in this moment. Um, and so as artists, when we think about uh, you know, is this piece of work going to change the world? Well, maybe not today, right? Yeah. But you will have the opportunity to unite people in ways that you never would otherwise. And I see some person in the comments said, I'm already in tears. And I have to say, even before this started, I was getting choked up just to see how many people were tuning in. So let's get started. Right. Um, let's talk about this as if it's four weeks. Right. If we're going to focus one month on getting shit done. Um, walk us through week number one. So week number one, and, and I, you know, originally we talked about it was a four week challenge. Um, you, anybody out there, you can look at, hey, if you want to take it as four weeks, that's brilliant. If you want to take it as four parts and spread it out over four months, eight months, a year, that's terrific as well. Or if you just want to look at it as these are four areas of getting your work done, just please take it as encouragement. But I do think it's always important to set goals for yourself, realistic goals, not easy goals. If you know you can write six pages a day, don't set your goal at five. If you set a goal of 10 pages a day and you know you can only write four, you're going to get depressed. So please just look at this as encouragement. And we look at that first part is really IDing the piece of material that you want to attack. And for everybody, it, it's different. And for where you are, it's different. But I think it's very important to always be honest with yourself. You know, when you're in front of other people, you can say the things that you need to say. 
But with yourself, what do you really want? If you want to just make a big studio sell, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want you, hey, you are an artist at your heart and you're only going to do little indie things that you can control. That's great too. But it's very important to identify what you want to do. We all want to sell our product at the end of the day, but understanding the marketplace, you want to do a studio sell, what's actually selling at studios today that is not already IP that they own and understanding how you can get your foot in the door. If you want to write a script so it's just a calling card and you can get representation, well, then maybe it can be a little bit more personal and more unique and really show who you are as an artist. If you're writing a script because you want to make a small film and you're relying on friends and families and your credit card, well, then it better be something that's not, you know, 120 pages and takes place on four different planets. But I, I say that to just understand that beginning process. It's not really a frivolous thing of just saying, hey, I'm going to go write a script. If the end goal is to sell it, to have a calling card, to um, actually make a film, then that really begins with your choice of that material and understanding if you're doing something historical and based on fact, are you doing your own research? Do you need to go out and acquire um, an article or a book or work with a journalist? Um, those are things that are very real. So it may seem kind of weird to say, oh, you know, pick a product because you know in your heart, oh, I, I wanna tell this story but does the end game for what you want to do line up with where it begins? Yep. And ultimately, is this a script when you get to page 50 or 55 out of maybe 120, you're not looking at this going, oh gosh, I'd rather be outside. I'd rather be spending time with my partner. I'd rather be golfing. You know, one of the reasons I'm not on social media, not just who I am in my age, anything that distracts from writing, anything that is not my family, does not get time in my life because everything else goes to writing. And that's just the, that's just the way I'm wired. So I'm very fortunate to have a wife who can um, put up with that. I got very fortunate to have kids who are, you know, pretty self-sufficient, but understanding, you know, and I go through this all the time. What is that next thing I'm going to do? Most of the scripts that I write now are just projects that I love. I don't know if they're going to get made or not. It doesn't matter to me. Again, I know I'm very fortunate in that regard. But understanding what you want to achieve coming out of it is really where you've got to begin. Understand what the end is. Same as writing a script in and of itself. You, you kind of want to know what that end beat is. Same with the product. You want to know what that end result is. And then it becomes about all of those things, the research, um, the space, the time, the price point. Um, if you've never written a script before and you have a friend who's a producer, sit down with them and really understand what every page is going to cost you um, because that's going to make a difference where you go when that product is completed, you know? Yeah, I will say, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time talking to creators in their early stages of products and they projects and they, they come to us with like the, the big, like $11 million period piece thing that they've like whittled down to this, like, and they've never made a feature film before. Right. And I'm like, and and their goal is to make the movie and and they're like now i need like major investment and i need a production company involved and there's all these barriers all of a sudden in between them and making the movie so i think it's also really acknowledging what you're saying your end game is if my end game yeah. is make the movie then the script also has to help you remove barriers to making the movie um and so that 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 def definition and where you are i will say this as a person with two toddlers who is working on a short film right now I am able to advance it for 30 minutes a day. Right. That's what I can do. I like I send one email and I'm like, well, I did my creative work. Like <laughs> that's what I can do today, right? So I do think it's also it's important when you when you scope it that you also look at the dynamics in your life. Like you talked about your wife and your kids, and you said your kids self sufficient, and I was like, I'm in the opposite. I'm in the opposite. <laughs> they're You're also right. much older, so I call yeah. them kids, but they're on the verge of adulthood. But you know, when I was much younger honestly banging out 20 pages a day. You know, we talk about this four week challenge and I actually did it once in my life, sold the script, the script got made into a film. Now the, the, the time between I turned in the script and the script got made was certainly not, you know, an additional one week, but, but it really, and, and trust me, I was younger. I was still single. Um, I had the capacity to, to go away and really write. So this concept of a four week challenge is, is not something that comes from nowhere. But, but I do acknowledge, you know, it, it, it may be a stretch for a lot of people, but I think you make a really good point, Emily, in knowing 
your capacities and knowing what it takes to actually get that amount of work done. I still write a lot, but just as an old, tired person, you know, I'm, I'm the same with you. It's like, oh, geez, I, I thought about it. I read an article on, on Google. I'm good. I, I've done so much work today. I'm, I need to, to go sit down for five hours. But it doesn't, until you start, you can't finish. And until you know what that end game is, you can't really start. And I, and I talk all the time about, as a, a creator, understanding editing. I think as writers, we spend too much time thinking about writing and we don't really think about once you've shot it all, once you got it all done, how do you really understand how to put it together? And even in the script phase, editing is, you know, there's, there's no department in making a film that ever gets the credit that it deserves, but I really think editors, you know, people don't look at them as, as, as artists and they are artists, they are partners. But understanding editing, even as you go through that script and how do I get in and out of the scene? How do I do it artfully? How do I um, become elliptical in the storytelling? How do I create these illusions of cleverness that, you know, now even for me, people, oh my God, it's so clever. I go, yeah, because I had a great editor who saved my bacon at the end. It wasn't clever. Somebody sat and said, well, this is crap. This is crap. You got these two things are good. How about we bookend it? Brilliant. Love it. So, bef but before we before we get too deep into the process, spend yeah. five more minutes with us on the idea, like the the what and the why. How do, how do we how do we do that? So, part of the what and the why is is honestly sitting with yourself and kind of as I said, and I mean this very sincerely, you're going to get halfway through your project, um, and you're going to feel like you're wandering in a desert, and you don't know if there's an oasis at the other end. Do I go back? You know, spend that time up front, knowing that through that journey you personally are going to be emotionally excited about whatever it is. If you love romantic comedies, you know, it may not be the best idea to say, hey, I'm going to do this really painful deep dive into history. Um, you know, I, I don't care what people say, you know, all oh, romantic comedies are dead. Nobody wants to see those anymore. No, it takes a really great one to get people back in the mood and, and reset things. You know, um, what Get Out did in melding all of these genres and then people say, oh my God, it was a cultural moment. Yeah, because somebody had the capacity to make it into a cultural moment. Everybody has that capacity, but it really begins with you being so passionate about what you're doing that not only will you be able to sit with it in whatever amount of time it takes to write it, not only in the middle of it, will you not turn your back on it and put it away and go, you know, this was a horrible idea. But when you do come out of it, you're going to be able to look people directly in the eye and say, this has value and I believe in it and you should believe in it and we can attract the talent to get it done. So what is that thing that's going to make you um, every step of the way? It, it is your, your partner. And when you are doing anything else, when you're talking to other people, you know, part of your brain is still thinking about this project. Um, it, it, it just, it, it overwhelms you in the desire to, to get it done. Um, that's, that is ultimately the thing. It, it, for me, to you, um, you certainly have to be cognizant of the marketplace, but it's got to be a passion project. You have to be cognizant of the price point, but it's got to be a passion project. And then, as I said, knowing all these other things, do you have to acquire a book? Do you have to acquire an article? You know, if you, if the only real piece of history around the project that you're doing is, is one book, and you can't go out and find all these other things, you've got to be prepared to then at some point go to the journalist or the author and really approach them and, and acquire that material and, and all those things that it means. Um, if it's a romantic comedy, how is it going to distinguish itself in a marketplace where people feel like um, romantic comedies aren't really working anymore? Um, you know, something like Booksmart, which is just, uh, it was just, in some ways, it was just a teen comedy. In other ways, it was, I don't want to say groundbreaking, but it really shook the ground. Mm -hmm. and, and taking things that, to, again, the prevailing culture are not normal. I really want to put that in heavy, heavy quotes and saying, fuck that. It's as normal as anything else. Um, and, and in some ways, making it so normal is what makes it extraordinary. But it really comes down at the beginning, understanding the marketplace, understanding what is passionate, understanding what is driving you really looking at maybe three or two or three ideas and saying at the end of it, you know, I'm, I'm choosing you because you tick all of these boxes. I believe in you. I'm excited about you. I can 
research you in some way. I believe I can use you at the end to, to fit my needs. Again, whether it's a pure cell, whether it's a calling card, um, whether it's getting your foot in the door, you know, some of the first things I wrote didn't get made, but they agents looked at and said, this guy's, you know, he's got some level of talent. That's not a bad thing either. So it's understanding, I think, many, many aspects of that work mm -hmm. and then deciding which piece actually is going to allow you to do all of the things that you want to do. Primary, finishing it is the biggest thing, right. but in having it done, that it then, it, it just, it doesn't just sit there because right. none of us want it to just sit there. Right. Okay. You said the words, having it done. Right. So week number one, we've made like maybe a mood board of all of our ideas. We've right. kind of, we've taken relative stock of, um, do I have access to the research or can I invent this entirely? And uh, and this is the one I'm the most passionate about. I don't know, do you give it like a one to 10 scale of like this one's a nine and that one's a seven, but the seven has more, I have more access to things. Yeah. Um, so you, 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 you choose the one you're working on and then week two, you are making a draft. Yeah, my fear, Emily, is that when I pass, when I finally pass and people go on my computer and it, the things that they see are not these other weird things. It's my first drafts. <laughs> and they will look at those and go, wow, we had this guy completely wrong. But I want to tell everybody out there, well, one of the barriers, I think, to getting anything done is that we become so concerned for every word, every sentence, every part. It's got to be perfect, perfect, perfect. And I'm telling you, it has to be the opposite of perfect. You got to blow through it. You got to get it done. You will not know what you're really doing. And I just want to take a second. A lot of these things I'm saying, look, this is my opinion. This is things that work for me. Please, they're not sacrosanct. You're not at the temple right now. But one of the things that I really believe, and I'm doing it right now, it's just getting to, if I get to 80 pages on a first draft, I know that's going to be a 140-page script, and then I got to cut back. But if you are, you know, let's not take this, four week challenge literally, but if you're a month into your project and you're still on page 20, you know, you, you are damaging yourself and you're damaging to me your psyche as opposed to getting it done and having so much stuff that all of a sudden you have to have an attic sale wow. and you're pulling things out and going, this one is precious. This one means something to me. This one I thought meant something, but it's just junk. This is kind of nice and I actually want to take it and get it reupholstered and I got to do some work on it, but it's going to be special and it's going to remain as part of the family. I really think that first, that first, you know, the second step, that first week of real work, whatever that time frame is, yep. getting it done, getting that script on the page, getting the words out there, knowing those scenes that are going to work and are going to be great, knowing those scenes you're going to muscle through. When I write a script, you know, it's, you know, Bob and Carol in a room talking. That, that's the only description I get. I'm not... You know, it's a big room and behind them is a painting, you know, that will come. Yeah. But to begin with, Bob and Carol in a room, the, the scenes I know, I write them. They're out of order, but I get them done. The scenes that are going to be more problematic, they're slugs and we'll get to them. Uh -huh. But more than anything, in that, in that first step phase is that first draft, nobody needs to see it. Nobody needs to know whether it's good or bad or what have you. But if you don't get it done, my feeling is I never know what works and what doesn't work. I never know. I write scenes and sometimes I'm writing it. And I know this scene is not going to exist. It's garbage. But if I don't set it out there and I don't array all of these instruments, how do I really know what I need? How do I, you know, even if it's a scene that doesn't make it, does it help inform that character? Does right. it give a backstory? Is it excavation? Does it cause me to do a little more research about something that informs it? Um, there were so many things in 12 Years a Slave that were not on the screen. I mean, I had this opening that I was just, oh, this is, this is the opening. Nobody ever saw it. I don't think ultimately it should have been in, but it really helped me understand the world that I was trying to excavate. Wow. So more than anything in that process, what I'm really saying is in that first draft, it's your time to discover. It's your time to make mistakes. It's your time to be brilliant. If, if there's in that first draft, there's one scene that is so brilliant that 15 years from now, people are talking about the brilliance of that scene. That's not a bad thing because nobody's going to compare it to the stuff in that script that doesn't work. And I'm, I'm speaking for me. I promise you, 
there is so much garbage in what I do, but, but that is part of also just getting it done and then being able to move to, and I don't want to quite get there yet, but that next phase Emily, of really getting down to the writing and the work. Writing to me is rewriting. Yeah. And that rewriting process can only happen when you really um, get something on the page and look at it and say, yeah, man, I always knew that scene was going to work or other places where you go, that was crap. I always knew it was crap, but it got me to the things that were very important in the script. So a couple of things I just want to pull up because you just blew my mind. I guess we're a little bit of it. Um, uh, you don't have to write in linear order. Had no idea. <laughs> like I know that's so obvious. But I, I have always like, well, you have to write the next scene now. I don't know why I couldn't have just like when I know what a scene five scenes from now is going to look like. So that, that's like that just feels like oh, you just break open. Um, I have to say also, I'm seeing some names of some artists I recognize and also admire in the comments asking questions. Um, one of two that I think are interesting, one from Amy Adrian, who made an amazing film called Half the Picture, which premiered at Sundance a couple of years ago, um, asking, uh, are you outlining? You know, I when I work in television, a lot of it because of, you know, the process and, and that you're working with a studio and a network, do a lot of outline. Things are very specific. You break things down. You really need to show your work. It may change, but you, you just have to. When I write for myself now, I, I don't outline because part of that is for me. Again, this is just what works for me. I, I really enjoy the discovery. Um, I'm working on something. Uh, I don't mean to be arcane. I just can't talk too much about it. And we kind of had the inbeat. We kind of had the inbeat. And just Along the journey of research and discovery, I found something that I was completely unaware of, and it was just so amazing. It was fun. You know, it, it, it makes it fun for me to not sit and go through this, you know, very analytical process of, you know, we have to have the scene here and I'm locked into this. You know, again, when you're working in a space where you're working with a studio and a network, you may have to do it, and, and, and there's an expectation, and, and they're paying hopefully to you a lot of money. So they want to see what you're doing. But, you know, even now for me on this project, it's, it's, it's at a, a, a studio, but you know, I'm just again, fortunate where they don't necessarily want me to prove everything I'm doing. They want a great script, but it's enjoyable. I know my destination. I want to get from LA to New York, but I'm going to meander a little and I'm going to, Hey, I've never been to South Dakota. Let's drive up there and see what's going on. Wow. I've discovered something here. Well, let me go over here. Mm, biggest ball of yarn really should not have gone to see that. But it, 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 it keeps me interested because um, it's just discovery. Every page, every day is a little bit more of a surprise and it keeps me going. But if you love to outline and outlining helps you by all means, you know, to me, again, what is it that keeps you going day to day, scene to scene, page to page, whatever gets it done is the right thing to do. I love that. So the, the next question I have um, that came, I think from Michael Stahl David, who is a brilliant actor I once knew in New York who's been in a few films I really love. Um, how much do you know about your characters before you sit down? Like before you're um, so like beating this draft out, right? You're just gonna get right. it done. How much do you know about your characters? I think that's a, it, it, it is a really good question and, and I would put it really in, in kind of two different pots. And part of it is the historical where I work with historical characters. And part of it is, you know, these kind of fictional characters that ultimately in some way, you know, are, are micro versions of, of me. So um, in the spaces where it's historical, I try to know as much as I possibly can. I, I try to unearth things that other people would never know. And, and you know, it, it, it's just, I, I don't know that you, you can get into it unless you really live with that, that, that person and that character. And, and I've been very fortunate to work with characters that I want to be very honorific about, um, not to make them angels, not to demonize them, but to really be honorific. So, I try to know as much as I possibly can and, and, and try to um, be respectful to them and their place in history. With characters who are fictionalized, I know them because ultimately they're, 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 they're extensions of me. They're, they're prisms, they're shards of myself. Um, sometimes they're disguised very well. I'm always sort of surprised where people assume a particular character is more of me than another character. But um, 
they're all, you know, they, they, they really come to life. I think a lot of the more fiction work I've done has been on television and writer's room. They come to life with the other writers who are in the room who bring their, um, you know, back to the question about organization and outlining, you know, when, when I do do that in television, I tend to show up in the writer's room on day one, with everything outlined, everything there. I'm really not, I don't believe in the process of, Hey, what do you guys want to do? Um, I think too many showrunners, again, whatever the process is that works, works for me as a showrunner. I don't want to show up on day one and not have very specific ideas. If we can beat them, let's beat them. But what I really look to the writers for is, um, I like to populate my rooms with people who are not like me, because if you've got, you know, six or eight people just like you sitting around, where, where, where is, where's the diversity of thought coming from? I don't mean physical or biological or, or orientation diversity, because I don't think that's diversity. I think that's representation. As a writer, I think those two words are very, very different. But there is a diversity of thought. And, you know, as a person of color of a certain age, from a certain region who lived a certain life, um, I can't look to myself to represent the world. It's weird when people look, hey, you're a black guy. We need you in the room. Um, no, I told you this story before, Emily, where you know people approach me about show running a show about a Hispanic family. And I'm like, you know, dudes, I'm, I'm black. I'm not Hispanic. There is a difference. So um, the... Uh, Good job, Hollywood. The, yeah, they, they got to get it. So finding those characters, again, from history, it's a deep, deep dive. In fiction, it's populating a room with people who can really help those characters come alive. So um, I just want everyone to know, I am taking furious notes about your questions, and I'm, I'm going to try to get to them in the right sort of time. Um, I want to move on to, so you've spit out the draft in kind of whatever works for you. Right. Outline, write your synopsis note cards, whatever, get the damn thing on the page. Yes. And I will. I would encourage you who are um, watching to go back through the comments because uh, the writers who are watching are all giving their own tips as well and what they do. And so I think you can also find additional really cool ideas there. Um, so stage th week three, we got a chance to prep this and I, I gave this a name because you use this wonderful phrase. Week three is stage tricks. Can you talk about what you mean by stage trick? I, you know, the first showrunner I ever worked with, this guy, Jordan Moffat, who was a great guy and, and really made an impact on my life in, in all ways, uh, you know, from, from giving me my first job to just teaching me about writing. And one of the things that he talked about was what he called the illusion of cleverness and taking things that are very fundamental. And, and his example that he used and it may seem really super fundamental to people, but sometimes I think if you don't break these things down, um, and, and, and by the way, I've, I've said this to people, I've never like tried to pass myself off as being clever, and, and you'd be surprised the high level, amazingly talented people that I've worked with, where they go, wow, oh my God, you know, it's showing people a trick, and then you show them the trick, and they go, well, that was nothing. So when Jordan was talking about the illusion of cleverness and the example that he gave was just really bookending scripts and taking the time to set things up early and pay them off later, dovetailing things so that people, you know, they don't maybe quite see that ending coming, but when it comes, it's reinforced in a way because you've set it up early. So when I talk about, you know, these stage tricks and the stagecraft, um, again, to me, in some ways, it goes back to the editing and looking at scenes and just doing things like pre-lapping and doing things like, um, you know, layered dialogue doing things that once it's hopefully filmed, um, it, it starts to look like, um, you know, one of the editors that I work with a lot, and, and I, I, I give shout outs to people like Jordan, I give shout outs to people like Hank Corwin, who's an amazing editor, um, worked with Oliver Stone and Terrence Malick at the height of his, at their powers, um, uh, got nominated uh, finally for the big short, worked on Vice, He's uh, works now with Adam McKay a lot. He's an amazing guy, and one of these things that he really talks about is just being elliptical. He talks about being origamic in his writing, and even things on the page, where are you calling back? Where are you taking scenes and moments where, um, as a writer, I love words, words, words. I think I told you before, Emily, um, the thing that's made me a really good writer now is taking words out and, and looking at a scene where this one is going to be wordy as hell because I love being a writer. This scene is just going to be about the actors and their mood and their emotion. And 
at some point, you know, people have talked about scenes that I've written and it's like, oh my God, that was so powerful. And I go, yeah, it wasn't a word in that scene but allowing space for actors to act, allowing spaces for directors to direct, allowing spaces for where you set something up and hopefully the audience doesn't see it coming, but the payoff and, and whether it's in a sixth sense fashion or it's big and mind blowing, whether it's in a very emotional fashion where it's just a little thing, but at the end people are going, oh my God, that, that's so powerful. What are in your script? As you now go from just being crap on a page to really honing it and refining it and shaping it, um, you know, whether, you know, glass blowing, um, steel work, you know, it starts with just fire and fury and mess. And at the end, it's something so precious, but that's the, I don't want to say artifice as though it's not real or worthy, but to me, that's the crafting of it. And that's where the real artistry of a writer um, flowers as a young writer, believe me, it was words on a page. It was being on a set, going up to actors. Yeah, I'm sorry, that take you said, uh, and it's the. So I'm sorry, we're going to have to do it again. And that's not really, to me now, is hopefully a slightly more mature person. You know, that that is not writing in and of itself. It is taking all of these tricks and all of these things that I love as an audience member and seeing these films that are put together and they're just magical and powerful. Um, one of the great things right now about um, being in a pandemic, if there's any good thing about it, is just catching up on great films that, you know, even I have not seen. And right now I'm watching Last Picture Show, which I'd never seen, oh. I hate to say, but the artistry in it, beyond the words on the page, beyond the directing, every aspect of it. But you as a writer have the opportunity to not just write a script, but really indicate artistry. Even if another director comes along later and says, well, I'm gonna do this with this. Where are you using the illusions of cleverness? Where are you using the artistry, the stagecraft that you have the capacity then to elevate your script? If week one is getting that idea that you love, if week two is just putting crap on a page, yeah. week three is, if you muscle past part two, the great thing is um, week, Three, part three, where you get to be you, where you get to be an artist. And one of the reasons I really encourage people to get past part one, because part two is just, it's its rolling in freshly cut grass. It's hearing the laughter of children. It's surprising your partner at the end of the day where you thought they for, you forgot their anniversary and surprise. Here are all these things. It's the trickery in life that makes us feel alive. And that's what I encourage you to do in week three is bring that script, that project to life. Could you, could you this is, this is I'm getting back to my microphone, I'm sorry. But, um, uh, could you give us give an example from your own, your own writing, writing of something, something you like and you were like, like, that's the good shit? Um, you, that's tough because A, it's hard to think of on the moment and B, then I self-aggrandize, but um, Um, I would, I would probably point you to season one of American crime and just how we inverted Hector's story. Mm -hmm. Um, in particular, how he was the most minor character. I don't want to give anything away. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but, but his journey, um, I knew very early on where I wanted that journey to go and how I wanted to surprise people with it. Um, and the last scene, the last moment, the last almost words he says, which is where the illusion of cleverness, I would say, comes in, um, was, was built from the ground up and, and from the very beginning. Mm. And it was kind of tough because there were people who, you know, another reason why I'm not on social media, people, oh, why are you doing that? Why are you, why are you doing that? Why are you, why, are you, why are you presenting that? I always knew where I wanted to go. I always knew where I wanted to end and for that trick to work, you really, not you, not anybody who's watching, I needed to lean into certain things. But then at the end of it, where people were as much as possible kind of mind blown by all these things that happen, you know, it looks more clever than it is, but because we, we really plotted it out very early on mm -hmm. to um, build things up, break them down and, and rebuild them. So I think I would really point people to, um, 
you know, American Crime season one in particular, where there were just so many things in it where people were like, how do you do that on broadcast television? How do you do Because we really plotted out. We presented it to our corporate masters. They were blown away by it. There were some things we had to fight for. But at the end of the day, you know, it was a show where, where again, where, where people had given up on broadcast television and not certainly not through my own work at all, through an amazing crew, an amazing cast, an amazing group of writers. We were just able to upend expectations. But it was that illusion of cleverness. It's a really straightforward, fundamental show. But in its dispensation, there were just so many moments where people were like, Jesus, I, I, I can't believe you could do that on broadcast television. Well, you can if you plan and you explain it and then actually able to execute on it. It's, re it's really incredible. OK, so. Um, and I'm only doing this for time because I, I can see that there are thousands of questions and um, I may just lean on you a little bit to do this again with us so that we can address the world's questions for John Ridley, which will be the new name of the series. Um, uh, week four is uh, you have, um, you've gotten your idea out and you know what you wanna do with it. You've gotten it down on paper and then you've taken the time to really make it the thing that you want it to be. And week four is applying a very new skill. It is the pitch. Yeah, here's the thing that's weird to me is that there's so many writers that I work with who are amazingly diligent and they get it done and they have ideas and they're self-starters and they execute. And then you come to that last phase and it's just the most frightening thing in the world. Some of it you can understand, you know, the, the fear of public speaking is like number two to death. Um, but it's so important to be able to communicate your idea. And the more outside of the mainstream your idea is, the better you need to be at communicating it and really looking people in the eye and saying, I'm doing this project. I can get it done. I believe in it. I can make it happen. And I mean, literally looking people in the eye. You know, when, when I did the Hendrix film that I did, which was a relatively small film, but really the project that, that changed my life, changed the trajectory of my career. You know, people were like, well, you can't do it. You don't have the rights. Everybody's trying to do a Hendrix film. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. I can't tell you how many times I've heard can't in that process. And I learned more than ever to really look people in the eye and to pitch them on things and to say things and to say them as though they were truth and fact. Um, even in certain circumstances when I knew that they weren't truth and fact, you know, um, uh, you know, a fact is a, a, a just a, a lie that's being um, waiting to be made real sometimes. And, you know, it, it can be even certainly, I think we see all too often in negative ways that's happened, but you can believe in yourself when no one else does. You can pitch your story, but beyond just showing up and saying, well, I guess it's a romantic comedy and I, I guess, you know, people would like it you know, talk the language of the executives, know that language, what quadrants are you gonna play in? What price point are you gonna make it? Um, who are the people that you're gonna go out to to get it? Um, what other films are like it that have worked and that they should um, use as a model? Um, I had hoped today, and I don't say this in a negative way, I just wanted to show people, you know, you, in, in the modern space, you have the capacity to go out and do little pre and do little, proof of concepts and do little sizzle reels or do decks. You know, if you're walking into a pitch and all you have is yourself, hey, that's great that you believe in yourself, but if you've got a sizzle and you've got a deck and you've got things that you can show people, you know, it just, it ups the game a little bit. So in taking the pitch seriously and taking your time with an executive, you've done all this work to get in a room with an agent, to get your shot with a, a studio executive, to be in the room where it happens, you know, do everything you can to show the confidence that you have in yourself, looking people in the eye, having examples of films that have worked, having examples even sometimes of films that have not worked, but have been impactful. You know, I just did this on a pitch where I said, look, this film is not going to make you any money. Um, they didn't seem to believe that when I told them that. But um, there are these other films that are like it that have been hugely impactful. And if you're going to go on this journey with me, you know, be prepared to lead with impact and be able to absorb um, a, a, a relative loss. Hey, we all want to make money. We all want to be successful. 
But sometimes, you know, again, I've been very fortunate to partner with people who are sometimes less concerned about financial recoupment and are more concerned about doing something that's impactful. Obviously, not everybody can do that. I'm talking about studios. They can't lose money on everything. But go into a, a, a pitch prepared, ready, practiced. I, I, I practice my pitches. Um, again, if you sell it, there's no wrong way to do it. But whatever it is that gives you a heightened level of confidence is so vitally important once you've done all of this really important blood, sweat, and tears on the page to get into the room. So I want to, um, because we're doing we're doing the life cycle of an artist in one hour, um, and I want to recap really quickly for people. Week one is really figuring out what is the right idea to tackle. Week two is the draft. Week three is the rewrite. Um, which we call stage tricks because that's the that's the part where you put everything back together and really make it sing. And this week four is really crafting the pitch. And I actually think it's really important that you gave it as much time, the notion of the pitch as these other stages, because it is not the same skill as writing, pitching. Um, in fact, sometimes I find the more you know about your script, the harder it is to pitch in some ways. Um, so like I like to do, I teach pitching and I like to do this parlor trick where somebody pitches their script and I listen just for the things that excite me. And then I retell their script just with the most exciting things they said. And they're like, oh, that's so much better. And I'm like, it's because I just said the most exciting things you already said. Right. And that's why practicing is so, so important. Um, but I would love to know, do you find the pitching process sometimes sends you back into the rewrite? Um, that's a that's a really good question, and um, I, you know I, I think I'm kind of fortunate with in terms of pitches because we it's so planned out, and you know you, you even now like when I'm when I'm doing it where I really have to pitch a lot. There's you know you got to pitch it to the producer you work with, you got to pitch it to the studio, you got you know before you even get to the network or the content provider. So you've had these opportunities for people to go back whether I agree or disagree you know, hone it to a place where everybody feels really comfortable about it. But I do, you know, as much as someone can enjoy a part of the process that is very fundamental, I enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy going in and, and I think it's important to express that joy because as you say, if, if you are not excited about your product and that excitement doesn't come through, you know, people are spending money and, and part of it is calculations about, where does it play? How does it play? Who's going to come see it? But part of it is, wow, this person, man, they love this project and they're going to be there every step of the way. The good days, the bad days, when they're getting notes that they hate, um, when an actor says, oh, I love it and I, I want to have a meeting about it. Um, you, you, you've got to um, show that your excitement, like anything else, you know, if you go to a car dealer and they're like, yeah, I guess it's a pretty good model. I, I suppose the mileage is pretty good. You know, I, 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 everybody should have the opportunity to love their job. And this is an opportunity. Yeah, of course, if you're a writer and you're alone for months and you're muscling through it, you love your work. But you also then at some point have to get in front of people and say, you know, you, you should have that feeling when you walk out of the pitches. Ladies and gentlemen, you got five minutes to decide whether you want it because I'm happy to go all over town. And trust me, there are moments where I've been in pitches. And I, this is just this is killing me. It's not working. You never know who that person is who's going to buy it. I can't tell you how many times the pitch that felt the worst, felt the most disconnected, those are the people who go, wow, we love this and we want to get it. But you got to, again, this is artifice and, artifice and stage crap, but this is the one you do for the buyers. Some of the other stuff is for the readers, and sometimes the readers are the buyers, obviously. But this is the one where you're, you know, you're a carnival barker. You know, behind this curtain is the most amazing thing. I'm going to go through it. And trust me, when I pitch, it's the laughter, it's the tears, it's it's the whole thing. You know, it's not so fake that, you know, people can tell you're not really into it. But um, it, it really is incumbent upon you. It's your product. It's your your, your baby. Go out and sell it. But, but it does take, to me, some level of practice, some level of engagement, some level. I was talking to somebody you know, at every level about, I know uh, somebody, who, a friend of mine who got a Marvel film and they spent like 60,000 on their previs. You know, they had the money to spend. I've spent thousands on sizzles and previses. And I don't want to tell you what I spent on the last one that I just did, but it, but it was, 
I loved it. And I'm, I'm again, I, I'm so fortunate to be in a space where I can put that investment and then get it in front of people. But wherever you are, you know, for the 200 bucks that it may take you to, to get final cut, or, or even if you don't, I mean, you got, I, 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 too, I move, I have something, there's some kind of thing that's free. Apple has Apple, a public price of what you're uh, Yeah, Apple, one of, one of these big media, you know, software companies has a something that is on there. What, now that you've done all that work, what else are you doing to put, um, to, to, to be able to arm yourself with, with the tools that will allow you to, to sell it? And you are that salesperson. There's no better salesperson for your product than you. I, I had to pull this up from Devon Edwards. Pitching is like telling a juicy piece of gossip because the 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 deliciousness of sharing that secret. Do you know what I mean? And and I think that that's the piece that you're emphasizing here that this like perfect synopsis um, gives you the feel for is like it should feel great to talk to people about it. And for some of us, we have to practice a lot in order to get there. Like there are actors who seem to kind of like walk in and be able to embody a thing. And there are actors, and, and for some of them, they just like, that's, that's they, they get by doing. And there are actors who, it looks like that's what's happening on stage and it's because they've been practicing behind the scenes for ages. So by the time they get into the scene, like they know exactly what they're doing. And I think it's um, I think it's really interesting to also use this four week challenge to craft your process and to experiment a little bit with your process. I told you there'd be naked toddlers in the background and there are. Um, so hello world, these are my naked children. Uh, apologies for that. Um, but I, I think that the, like what I'm hearing out of this is like you're not being prescriptive. And if I may say, there's a ton of questions in the comments of like, should I do it this way or should I do it this way? Should I do it this way or should I do it this way? And what I'm hearing you say is it doesn't matter as long as you are doing it to the end, to the finish. And so this four week or four part process is really about completing each step and that you can't leave pitching out of the completion process. Is that like a fair way to kind of build that synopsis? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh no, there yeah, it is. No, there yeah. it, it's absolutely correct because whatever gets you to the finish line, the ultimate finish line is the absolute right way to do it. But if, if to me, if one is ignoring any step of this, then um, there's the opportunity for things to go wrong. And all I'm saying is, is if one goes through all that effort, and again, I see so many writers who are, they are those people who are self-sufficient and, and self-starters and have great concepts. And then you talk about going to the pitch. Oh my God, I don't, are you going to be in the room with me? Are you going to be there? And I'm like, yeah, I'll be there. But, but this is, I love your idea. They are interested enough that they've invited you. This is your opportunity, and I do like that that concept of what's juicy gossip. You know, how many times do people say to you, "Can you keep a secret?" Oh yeah, I can keep a secret. Oh yeah, I can keep. And the minute you're around the corner, oh my god, I got to tell you something. Oh, this is an amazing story, and it should be the same way with your script. You've been keeping this secret for weeks, for months, um, working on it. It's been alone, and now you have this opportunity to tell people about it. Some of you may be fast on your feet. You don't need to practice per se, but you know, are, are you going to go in and read off a page? And I can't stand reading off a page. I've seen people set up a script reading off of a teleprompter app on their iPad through the whole pitch. And I've sat next to them just going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. They solved it. So whatever you do is correct. But, but knowing that you need that teleprompter app to give you your best pitch, this writer knew it. And they got it and they sold it. So all I'm saying is don't leave whatever that process is and discover in the room, wow, I really needed that app to help me. Or you've got your face buried in it and realize, oh, I'm not connecting with people because you didn't take that time to figure out what's the best version of you. So no wrong way to do it. All I'm saying is figuring out for you, looking at every step and realizing that that's the way that it allows me to get to where I want to go. And accepting that challenge because you can figure out, I got step one down, step two. By the way, you may figure out you got six steps and I was lazy because I only gave you four. You may be a person, you got, you know, the, 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 the baking of the cake is in a couple of processes, but understanding what it takes for you to get to where you need and what is that breakdown for you? 
I also, I feel the need to like alleviate some instantaneous creator anxiety that happens when you talk about pitching to executives and network. Um, that's not where you're gonna go next with your first script or your second script. Like you make movies before you get there, you make projects before you get there. And now more than ever, um, if you ask an agent what they're looking for, they say um, it's like self-starters and self-generators, people who are already making stuff, already getting out there and already connecting with an audience. And those are all things you can do on your own. So sometimes when you're talking about pitching, especially if it's earlier in your career, you're actually talking about pitching to collaborators to producers, to crowdfunding audiences. You're talking about pitching to, um, you know, like a local business that has something that you might be able to need or use or a location. Um, it's, it's not necessarily um, uh, pitching to network, right? So, so do, I just don't want it to, like, there's just a ton of comments that came in immediately. It's sort of like, well, how would I pitch to network? How would I even get there? And it's like, slow down. Like it's a breathe. Uh, it's the, the, the pitching is a skill that you want to have practiced thousands of times before you ever get in a room at a network. Um, you don't want to be doing your first script pitch at NBC or something like, I mean, maybe you do because maybe you'll just, uh, maybe you'll be the one special person who gets picked, which is a Hollywood story they keep telling us to make us think that it's just about our intrinsic specialness and not about the hard fucking work of getting it done, right? Um, so I, I do just wanna like, I just wanna like ameliorate some of the like immediate comment anxiety that I was, uh, I was noticing. Um, and I want to just spend a few minutes um, taking so many of these incredible questions, if that's okay with you. Um, and I'm sorry that we're muting John just to mitigate some of the feedback challenge. Um, somebody asked if we're gonna teach a pitching course. So I think maybe we should. Listen, I would love to. I, you know, I always tell people, that, you know, take these things that I do as an example. Again, the, the, there's no wrong or right way to do it if it sets it up. But more than anything, I think really, I would love to be able to take time one day and explain the, the few fundamental things that you need. How do you get into it? How do you start it? How do you keep it tight? You know, you don't want to, you know, overstay your welcome, but you want to make sure things are, are um, uh, well explained um, and, and that the people understand that, you know, if it's a film, that it feels finite. If it's a TV show, that it feels like, okay, we're going to get eight, 10 episodes, three, five seasons, whatever they might need. So yeah, they were, listen, I love working with Stephen Spark. Happy to figure something out. Great. So but uh, just, I do want to also say I'm not, I, you know, as I'm sure you all know, it, it really comes down to what works for you. Right. Well, I do think to your point, like you just said some things that you said very quickly and are really amazing and could be practiced sort of for a lifetime, which is how do you make the pitch match the format? So are you unrolling a universe inside someone's mind that is many seasons of a TV show versus buttoning up a story in a format that makes sense for that thing? Um, like these are, these are the sorts of, of tips and tricks that really make a pitch sing. Can you tell us... Um, about a uh, a time when a pitch went really badly for you? Has that ever happened to you? Oh. <laughs> no, no, it's all been just great from day one. Pitch went badly, but it ended up well, or pitch went badly and it just kept going badly. I mean, no, no, I just just like what was it that that sort of went awry, and what did you learn? Well, there was one pitch that just stands out in my mind because it was just it was every bad thing that you can think of and. It was, A, it, it was in Santa Monica, and if you've ever been in L.A., you know, Santa Monica is like going to Antarctica. You know, it's just like, oh, God. Um, we were, it was a project that I was very excited about, and I wanted to write and direct, and I certainly was not a writer-director at that point, so there was friction before we even got in the room. And I was sitting down with people, and my style at that point, really, as you kind of say, creating this world and a vibe and you know, at the, at, we weren't even into it. And the executive was like, I literally said, I got to go get my kids. You know, is there, is there a story here? Cause I have to go get my kids. And I was just like, wow, you, you know, this, you know, and I've, I've certainly been in rooms where people have been gracious enough to pretend to be interested, but um, you know, the lack of understanding of who I was. And, and by the way, there was no, they had no, 
ability to understand who I was. I wasn't at that point in my career, but the lack of ability to even be gracious to the, and believe me, this wasn't like a five hour pitch. You know, we were just kind of into it and they were like, let's go. Um, which to me, the story didn't deserve because it was really interesting, fascinating story um, based on this French graphic novel. And that was part of it. And it kind of explained where it came from and all these kinds of things. So it was one of those things. I mean, look, it was bad enough to this day where I'm just like, wow, you, you know, okay, I drove out here too. I have kids too. You know, I'm not here to waste your time. This is an amazing, provocative, interesting story. Um and, you know, they had no interest. So, you know, the bad ones always stick with you. The good ones are the ones that get done. The, you know, the reason I ask about good versus bad, I've had bad pitches where they literally bought the show. The show ended up on the air the, and that kind of a thing. So, you know, good and bad are, you know, they have different meanings in different spaces. But, you know, trust me, it, it, it they can be awful. And you got to the difference between the good and the bad are you know, the good ones are easy to survive. The bad ones are the ones where you still got to pick yourself up and keep going. So there's, there's, there's something you said there that I think is really valuable, which is I think pitching is a great time also to find your people. So sometimes when a pitch goes badly, it's because you're not in the room with the right people. Um, and a lot of great pitching comes from uh, researching in advance who you're sitting down with and knowing how to sort of spin something that they'll love. Somebody asked about a book. I really like the book Good in a Room. Um, I think that's a, that was a great place that I definitely started looking at pitching. Um, I want to ask two more questions, then we have to wrap up because we're already at time. Um, because I think the bulk of the questions that I saw were um, uh, focused on um, keeping the process going. So you said inevitably there's going to be a place where we get stuck right? Whether it's in the draft writing or even in the revision place. How do, what do you do to maintain the flow? You know, it's for me, the writing process, and people often ask me, like, how, many, how much time do you actually spend writing? Um, and, and to me, I, what I try to really do is limit the time that I'm sitting in front of the computer writing, because it's, you know, even at this stage, is it's just at some point, there's a negative expectation activity. You know what I mean? It's just, I get tired. I get bored. I get, you know, even when you're getting paid to do a, a project that you're interested in, it's like you said, you know, so I looked up an article on Google, you know, I, I did my work for the day, but how much time do I actually spend thinking about that project elsewhere? And when can I think about those things when I'm out for a run, when I'm, you know, doing things that are not directly related to, that are not related at all to writing. And I think one of the reasons, again, going back to my lack of presence on social media, the fact that I have no friends, the fact that I don't talk to anybody, the fact that I'm such a loner, is that I try to create spaces where, you know, you're, you're, it, it's, it's almost piston driven, where you gotta get this steam power behind it so that 15 minutes that I actually do spend writing where it's just, you're banging it out, you're banging it out, you're banging it out. And I got to tell you, you know, because I'm, I'm reaching sort of that phase two on a project right now. And now it's like, man, you know, you, you, you're going through 20 pages at a clip. You know, you're going through and, and it's exciting because, oh, my God, now this scene is working. Oh, I set this character up. Oh, I, I got it. Now I know where this other scene goes. And now, you know, you get so emotionally invested that the pages fly by. So last night, you know, you know, it's weird because between the time that you and I just even talked about setting this up and i just mean in the last week or so i've gone from kind of a phase one to a phase two and this phase two is now it's like oh my god this is great you know this is it's fun again so that middle space is tough but don't you know if you're getting bogged down and sitting in front of your computer then get away from the computer go for a walk you know take the dog out spend time with your significant other or or something i don't want all of you to be anti-social um individuals but but you know, there, there is that bifurcated thought pattern. I, I cannot tell you how many times I'm sitting at people and, and I'm sitting in front of people and I got to go, okay, put that script away, look this person in the eye, fake interest and get back to it. But, but it, the, the writing process is less to me about the time that I spend writing, the time that I spend thinking. And the thinking is 99% of my life, you know, um, it truly is, is like just thinking, 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 time with the family or time writing. And I've gotten to the point where I've um, gotten better at, at, at 
maximizing the time that's actually that I spend in front of the computer or minimizing, maximizing the minimal time that I spend in front of the computer and really spending so much time just thinking, 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 thinking so that when we can get in front of the computer, it's either I'm, I'm struggling in that first phase and just getting whatever crap I can on the page. I'm in phase two and it's like, yeah, I've only been here for 20 minutes, but I, you know, you, you do a page a minute because you're flying by. I mean, if I can say for myself, the two things that have really freed me up in this conversation are the idea that I don't have to write linearly. And if I am stuck in a place, I can just be like, something happens here to get them to Nevada. And then I can just go to Nevada where I know what happens. Right? Um, because I like a road trip movie. Um, and that is really freeing just to think about like, I could get all the way to the end. I could get them to their destination and then go back and figure out what the fuck happened to get them to Nevada, right? That's one piece that's really interesting. The other piece, and it's funny because this was advice my my dad, who is a journalist, gave me was, you know, you get it, it, his process, and it was one that worked very well for me, was you get an outline together, right? And then he said to write a story on deadline, he would get up and take a walk around the block until he had the clear first sentence in his head. And that would give him the steam to sit down and sort of write it front to back because he already had the, the structure in place. And I always thought that was really interesting. And I have definitely found a lot of help in like, oh, right, you just need to literally take the space to think. Because it can't just be coming out of your fingers all the time. So that's just my son at the keyboard pressing the equal sign. Is his, that's his jam. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, look, the, the, it, it should always be pleasurable. You know, this is a, a, a job like any other job. You know, there, there are days where people ask me, oh, what it's like to be a writer. You're on a deadline. People have expectations. You have good days. You have bad days. But it really is, again, whatever you do in life, you know, enjoy it. And if you're, again, in the middle of it and you're really, really not enjoying it, then to me that that you, you've missed again that phase one that project where all the way through it and again I'm I'm no better or special than anybody else I can't say how many times I get to the end and it's like God I feel like I've been writing forever I'm on page forty but I know you know I, I I still love this project I still want to get through it and like I said I'm I'm my goal is is page eighty just get to page eighty I, I don't care what's on the page but get to page eighty because then it's I'm, I mean, the uh, somehow I got the page 80. I'm now on page one, 102, and I know I'm like going to be over. And now I'm like panicking because this is longer. You know, <laughs> we knew the budget, we knew where it needed to be. It was it was supposed to be 90 pages. It's 102. It's already too long. You know, and that's a good feeling, right. knowing that I got I got gold now. You know, or at least stuff that's closer to gold than it was coal. Right. So at least pewter. Um <laughs> So uh, John, tell us about the incredible organization you started and we're gonna start to wrap up and I'll tell everybody that actually we have some pitching workshops coming up. Um, so yeah, tell us about your amazing organization which I have had a chance to visit at No Studios. Right yeah, there. So no, no Studios, I can't, <laughs> I'm still not good at this film thing. Yeah, No Studios is something that I, my older sister Lisa really encouraged me to start. I won't go through the whole thing, but you know, after a very special professional moment in my life, my sister, you know, when other people were calling and congratulating, my sister was like, big deal. What are you going to do with it? You know, nobody's going to remember this in a year. And in some ways she was correct. And I really, you know, look, there aren't a lot of mountains to climb, but there is a lot of, you know, for me personally, left to climb, but there's a lot of space for me to reach back and help people up this mountain. And no studios in Milwaukee. Um, it's a great city, a city of my birth, where my parents still live. Unfortunately, a lot of the things that we're seeing on the headlines today, Milwaukee deals with on a regular basis. It is, by actual metric, the most segregated city in America. That is that is a fact. And it's very sad. And one of the things that really bridges us is art. Um, it brings us together in a true communal space. It brings us together like we are today with people from around the world who are like-minded, who are just working towards self-expression. So No Studios is a physical space, but we've made that pivot to an online space. We do many of the things that you're doing today, Emily, with Seed and Spark um, online and um, in the virtual space. So please visit us at nostudios.com. We are all about supporting artists, particularly artists from um, traditionally marginalized communities, but in reality who make up the bulk of the world. You know, we, we are, uh, I don't mean to sound, um, 
Pollyannish in this, but but we really are the, the fabric and the life of the world. And getting these voices out there, getting their artistry out there in every discipline, um, writing, photography, dance, visual arts, um, that's what we're all about. So we're really opening ourselves up in the virtual space right now. So please um, visit us at nostudios.com. One other thing that I did want to say, or just kick back to you, Emily, is that um, with Seed and Spark, I know that you guys are very into paying it forward. Um, we've got all kinds of folks who are online right now. And I really look to everybody, and I'll leave it to you, Emily, to, to give the particulars out. But, but we're looking for people to really, truly pay it forward. And if everybody who's on right now would donate just one dollar, one dollar to Seed and Spark, um, I'm willing to match that dollar for dollar up to $1,000 to make sure that we can, you know, really continue to support uh, emerging artists, emerging voices of any age, of any background, of any type. You know, you can be 65, 70 years old and you're emerging. Um, folks who wrote uh, Brokeback Mountain were not kids when they wrote that. Um, and it's, you know, one of the most impactful pieces, again, showing people that um, we are all, um, whoever we are, we're just as real, just as normal, just as regular, just as vibrant as anybody else. So Seed and Spark is an amazing organization. I really value the partnership that we built up with your organization, Emily. Thank you. Everybody out there, if you can give at least, at least, at least one dollar. Again, I'll leave it, Emily, to you to give the particulars how they can give. But I'm going to commit um, matching dollar for dollar up to one thousand um, dollars because I'm, I'm an old man. I can't do this forever. We need we need that next generation. And you're already there. You're already doing it. You just need to um, get the support that you all deserve. Thank you. Um, I'm so I, just so I can give you guys context for what just happened here. Um, for the first time ever at Seed and Spark, um, because pandemic, um, it's been really hard for us to find sponsorship for our education events. We've always done about 100, 120 live education events a year. Um, and our goal has always been to provide them for free who anybody for anybody who needs them. And we are committed to that all the way through the pandemic. And we are trying to survive as an organization. And so we thought that for those of you who can, and only those of you who can, and the rest of you should feel absolutely not one iota of guilt of spending that dollar on whatever it is you need. Um, if you can give, and we're gonna put the link um, so that we can continue providing these events um, for free for those who need them. And this is an entirely pay what you can or pay what it was worth to you. Um, uh, it will allow us to sustain as an organization um, and be able to continue providing events like this. Um, and it's, it's really just meant to be an expression of like, we're making this investment in our community and you came here to make this investment in yourself. And if you have the means to make any size investment in us, that makes a huge, huge difference. And I was just telling John like, oh, I'm just gonna plug this new thing. It's gonna feel so weird. And he's like, yeah, that's no problem. How about I match the first thousand dollars? And I um, I already cried about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more pulled together about it today. Um, although I'm going to fall apart again here in a second. I felt so bad. I didn't. We weren't on. Um, we were not on a, a FaceTime call, and I said, you know, and again, I just I love what Seed and Spark does, and I've just been so fortunate. So many people have supported me every step of the way, and I just, you know, I didn't mean to minimize it, but Emily oh, generally was amazing. like breaking down, and but but you know we're. We're here for you. So as Emily says, you know, give what you can. If you can't give anything, you, you've, you've shown up and you've shown that you um, are yeah. an artist who really takes your work seriously. And Emily, what I'd love to do again, I know we're running out of time. What I think would be great is maybe down the road a little bit, maybe not too far down the road. We do a catch up yes. and wherever people are in the process, less about me sort of explaining what things are. You know, where are you? How are you feeling? What kind of questions can we take? You know, what kind of guidance help support um i think that would be really terrific i always hate to lecture my experiences are not indicative of other people's experiences but i would really love to to catch up with folks and like i said i'm I, you know I'm, I'm not on social media i don't interact a lot so i think it would be really nice to you know to, to see where you are at the process whether you've taken the challenge literally or whether you've taken these pillars as um obelisks on your on your timeline to success just really be able to um, help you, support you, guide you, give you feedback 
in some ways along the line. So I would love to do a catch up at some point. We will do that. I aspire to be a person who can use obelisk in a sentence. That's going to be my goal for the next year. Um, I have to talk to everybody about two um, events that we have coming up next week that are relevant. And the first, um, our lunch and learn time next week, Wednesday midday, is a space for black and brown creators and storytellers to commune. Um, it is a lunch and learn about using art to connect and cope. Uh, Brandy Payne and uh, Ronnie Braithwaite, who are um, respectively uh, Memphis and Atlanta based uh, creators who also work at Seed and Spark um, are gonna be leading the conversation with a couple of other creators. And it's really a space for black and brown members of our community um, to come together and have a platform and a place. And I'm saying those words very specifically to you if you are planning to participate. Um, and then Friday, we have our creative sustainability summit or se session that is pitching during the pandemic and beyond. Um, with showrunner Annabelle Oaks, and she's bringing with her um, the television executive Richard Gold. So for those of you who are like, what do I do when I get in the room with the executive? There's literally an entire session about that next week. Um, and then we will bring it back with John in a couple of weeks to see where everyone is. Um, John, you are a heavenly creature, <laughs> a national treasure. We are so <laughs> lucky to have you. I get to say those things because you refuse to say them about yourself. I need to say hi and send all my love to your parents and your sisters, who are some of my favorite people on the planet. You met them, yeah. I, I did. I, uh, I I basically downloaded everything I could from your parents on parenting uh, in that time that I had with them. Um, and, uh, and if you have a sort of like send off piece of advice for us, um, what would you like it to be? You know, more than anything, as I said at the beginning, we really we do need you. You know, these are such troubling times, and unfortunately, uh, we can't really look to our our leaders to lead us. And um, I do believe in, you know, uh, government to a degree. I, I do believe in processes to a degree, but um, we need you, and we need you to activate your voices, your art, your artistry um, for positive change. But um, the, the reality is, is that artists have a level of um, connectivity that no other people do. And Roger Ebert used to say that art, when it works best, is an apparatus for delivering empathy. And those films, those books, those photographs that transport us, that connect us, um, are more important than ever. So I hope all of you get to a point where you're selling product. I hope that you can make your livelihoods from the thing that you do that you love. But more than anything, you know, if, if you are not out there using your skills to um, transform the world, uh, and, and again, I, I really believe that art is always and has been at the forefront of transformation, then we can't look to our leaders, certainly not here in Washington, and, and from all parties. I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed across the board. Um, I'm certainly, you know, I'm, I'm not going to suppose anybody else's politics, um, but I would love to see more leadership across the board. And if you're not finding that, um, you know, it, 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 if, it, if it's not on one end, as, as again, Dr. King talked about the deeper darkness, I don't want to go there either. So I don't want to make this, a, uh, I don't want to open and close on a downbeat. I, I really, more than anything, I want to encourage you all to be your best selves. And that starts with being the artist that you are and the humans that you are and finding that connectivity. So um, it's encouragement every step of the way. Um, and, and I really do look forward to reconnecting with you to a degree and, and finding out where you are in the process and, and how we can continue to encourage you because you are, every one of you from around the world, you are so desperately needed right now, right now. Thank you, John. We will see you again very soon. Thank you, world, for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we crashed our donation page, so we'll wow. try to get that back up and running wow. in minutes. Um, you guys are all amazing. I really appreciate it, and we will talk to you soon, and be well, take care. Thank Fight you. Fight everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.